Today is November 5th, 2022. I want to talk about the situation in and around Ukraine, Russia's continued military operations there. And I want to start by taking a look at this article here from Defense News. U.S. Netherlands go Dutch to refurbish Czech tanks for Ukraine. And the article says... The U.S. and Netherlands are splitting the cost of refurbishing 90 more Czech T-72B tanks for Ukraine in Kiev's fight to repel Russia, the Pentagon announced Friday. It also says the first batch of tanks is expected to be delivered to Ukraine as early as next month, according to the Dutch Defense Ministry. And when they're talking about overhauling tanks, we, we can assume that these were tanks that were in storage that were not being used and and really weren't going to be used uh, until they decided to pull them out, refurbish them, and send them. The U.S. Department of Defense, in its own press release about this $400 million in additional security assistance for Ukraine, says the overhauled T-72B tanks included in this package are part of a trilateral coordinated effort with the Netherlands and Czech Republic, alongside the United States, the Netherlands will provide 45 additional T-72 tanks with the support of the Czech Ministry of Defense and in co cooperation with Czech industry. And the Pentagon, when asked why they don't just send American tanks, M1 Abram tanks, they more or less say that it's because it's impractical. You would have to train Ukrainian crews. They're unfamiliar with them. They have entirely different needs in terms of maintenance and logistics. The M1 Abrams tank, for example, has a turbine engine. Uh, these tanks that Ukraine are operating mostly have diesel engines. So that's just uh, a couple of many reasons why the U.S. cannot do this. It, it is impractical. This aid package that the U.S. is sending, as you can see, includes many items. And I'm going to go over them. So the first one on the list is funding to refurbish Hawk Air defense missiles for inclusion in future presidential drawdown packages. So that's another, that's another form of assistance that requires refurbishing before it's sent to Ukraine. So it's not coming now. And when it does come, most likely not all at once. 1,100 Phoenix Ghost Tactical Unmanned Aerial Systems. The U.S. has been sending these to Ukraine, and I have not heard anything at all about how they are performing on the battlefield. And I'm going to have to assume that if they were making any kind of difference at all, the Western media would probably have mentioned it by now. 40 armored river riverine boats. Ukraine does not have a navy, but they are using these small boats to cross rivers to try to storm Russian positions on, on the opposite bank. And if you're following these operations, you will know that Ukraine could lose 5, 10, 20 boats in a single operation. So uh, 40 armored riverine boats. That just helps you put that number in perspective. Funding to refurbish 250 M1117 armored security vehicles. These are not even used by the U.S. military in frontline combat. They're used by the U.S. Army's military police. And again, this is another item that needs to be refurbished before it is sent to Ukraine. So it's not coming now. And when it does come, it will come in batches because you can only refurbish a certain number of systems at a time. Then you send them to Ukraine, then you get the next batch ready and send them. And because we're talking such small numbers, when the next batch arrives, the first batch is most likely going to have been disabled or destroyed on the battlefield. This is the constant problem Ukraine has had throughout this entire conflict. The U.S. is also sending tactical secure communication systems and surveillance systems, uh, no, no details provided, and funding for training, maintenance, and sustainment. So we went from the initial assistance packages sending large amounts of equipment from existing inventories. As that dwindled, the U.S. started talking about signing contracts with its military industrial complex. But these contracts are for producing weapon systems months, if not years from now. We don't even know what the battlefield is going to look like, or even if there's a battle ongoing by the time these weapon systems are ready. 
And now they are allotting money to refurbish old systems that weren't being used, couldn't be used unless refurbished. They are putting money into this. And this is how they're going to try to continue keeping this conflict going for just a little bit longer. They are really scraping together whatever they can find. These are not the most suitable systems to send Ukraine. It's simply what they have that they can send Ukraine. So what about Russia? You see uh, Ukraine running out of tanks, essentially, and these ideas to try to replace them becoming more and more desperate. Uh, refurbishing uh, dysfunctional T-72s. They're even talking about sending T-55s, which is a post-World War II Soviet design. What about Russia? Are they running out of tanks? No, they're not running out of tanks. Uh, this is a video of Dmitry Medvedev. He is the deputy chairman of the Security Council of Russia. He had been president of Russia when uh, now Russian President Vladimir Putin was prime minister. Here is him at a tank factory with T-72s being modernized and T-90s being produced. So Russia has a supply of new tanks being built and ready for battle. Russia also has thousands and thousands of tanks in storage. So if they needed to pull out more T-72 tanks, T-80 tanks. They have these in storage that they can pull out and likewise refurbish. They're not, they're not really doing that yet. Now, we have heard about Russia taking T-62s out of storage. Uh, why would they do that? I've heard some ridiculous claims, such as corrupt Russian officials sold all of their T-72s in storage for, for scrap metal to make some money on the side. So they're out of... T you know, they sold thousands of T-72s for scrap metal, and all they have left is T-62s, as if T-62s aren't also made out of metal that you could scrap and make money off of on the side. I want to direct your attention to Michael Kaufman. He is a, a Ukrainian-born Western analyst working for these, these government and corporate-funded think tanks. Uh, very pro-Ukrainian, but even he is dismissing the idea that these T-62s are being pulled out because Russia is out of tank. So uh, here's his tweet. The T-62s are for reservist units. Activating them implies reservists will be called up and sent. It doesn't mean Russia is out of other types of tanks in storage. Those are expected to replace losses in the active force. As for the T-62 itself, old but old tanks still kill. I want to show you this next article here from Military Watch magazine, building a me mechanized core for the Donbas, why Russia is modernizing its T-62 tanks for recommissioning. And it says T-62 is prized for its much lower maintenance requirements and operational costs and is also straightforward to train on, allowing new personnel to learn to operate the vehicles relatively quickly. This was reported this was reportedly behind Russia's decision to export modernized T-62Ms from its reserves to equip new Syrian army units in 2016. So there is a precedent for Russia using T-62s to transfer to local uh, forces, militias that are fighting alongside Russian forces. And to subsequently deploy the vehicles to eastern Ukraine, where they are thought to have been operated by local Donbas militias. For Russia, modernized T-62s can be used to equip not only conscript units, should it continue with mass mobilization, but also units from eastern Ukraine, Ukrainian regions, which, are, which were recently absorbed into the Russian state, the militia forces of which have still not been fully integrated into the Russian army. So there's a very specific reason Russia wants to use T-62s to arm these local forces, to, to arm units that normally wouldn't have modern Russian main battle tanks. This is the reason why they're doing this. Now let's talk about the situation around Kherson. I want to show you this BBC article here. Russia-Ukraine war at the front line of Ukraine's struggle for Kherson. Now, this is where Ukraine launched its largest, its first and largest offensive, and then it launched its offensive in the Kharkov region 
in the northeast afterwards, and its forces have been decimated, uh, trying to overwhelm Russian defenses. Russian forces are still there. They're still holding the city on the west bank of the Dnieper River. They have been evacuating civilians. I've had people ask me about rumors regarding whether or not Russian forces will abandon the city. All indicators seem to point to Russia making a serious attempt to defend the city and build up their defenses as much as possible before whatever it is that Ukraine has left in its offensive. I have also said that if Russian forces are overwhelmed, if it looks like they're about to suffer heavy casualties or lose large amounts of equipment, then they will withdraw like they, like they have been doing. They will preserve their fighting capacity. Whether they withdraw or they stay in Kherson city, they will take a huge toll out on Ukrainian forces. As you can see, Ukrainian forces do not have the ability to reconstitute their, these units that they're losing, uh, heavy tanks, main, main battle tanks. They cannot replace these. They, they're waiting for the US to repair old tanks that were in storage and send those. This is the situation that they're in. This is the BBC talking about the Kherson front. So they're quoting a Ukrainian soldier that they were interviewing. It's very hard to make progress here. It is necessary to concentrate a large amount of force in one point to break through the front line. Our job is to hold our position. We attack from time to time so that they don't take their reserves and transfer them somewhere else. It is very difficult and slow going. They control the sky. They've got much more military equipment, more people and more ammunition. This is something that I have been saying for months that a lot of people dismissed as Putin propaganda. This is a Ukrainian being interviewed by the BBC, British state media. The BBC also says, but General Marchenko, who became a hero in the Southwest in the first months of the war when he led the fight to stop the Russians advancing beyond Kherson towards Mykolaiv and Odessa, said it would be a much harder undertaking to concentrate enough force to break the Russian line and to mount an assault across to the Dnieper under the Russian guns. For a proper counteroffensive, we need to have the required number of personnel, weapons, and equipment. As soon as we get all of this, a counteroffensive will take place. First of all, we need reactive artillery that can hit up to 300 kilometers from us. And we need an air defense system, basics for any army in the world that wants to go on the offensive. For now, the big prize, Kherson itself, remains in the hands of Russia. Throughout the autumn, Russia has reinforced its positions there. General Bonanov, head of Ukraine's Directorate of Military Intelligence, said in a recent interview that Kherson was defended by Russia's best units from the Marines and Airborne and Special Forces. And then the BBC goes on and it says, it is hard to see why Russia would pull out of any part of Kherson unless it was under severe military pressure. The message from the front lines is that while Ukraine is taking villages in the big pocket Russia captured on the west side of the Dnieper River, it does not have the combat power to break through well-prepared Russian positions into Kherson city. That might change as more powerful weapons arrive from the US and Ukraine's other NATO uh, allies in NATO. What other weapons? What is the BBC saying? I read the whole article. They don't explain what heavy weapons. What what wonder weapons is the US going to send to Ukraine in enough quantities to, to break through Russian defenses? I honestly, I don't know. Then the BBC says, some Ukrainian sources have dismissed reports that the Russians could be pulling back from part of Kherson as a ruse to draw them into a rash attack. It is possible, however, that the Russian command might decide that the line of the Dnieper River is the best natural defense available, especially as its forces on the West Bank come under 
more pressure. Well, that, that could be a possibility. This is something only time will tell, because in order to know for sure, you need to know the, the true disposition of forces on both sides, including the, the logistical situation for both sides. And we, we simply cannot get a complete enough picture to make a confident prediction regarding this. What we can do is look at what the West has been reduced to sending Ukraine. They were sending newer systems, uh, systems in their existing inventories that their militaries were actually using. Now they've been reduced to sending older equipment, pulling equipment out of storage and refurbishing it. The problem with that is just like with manufacturing, you can only make so much at, a, at a, any given time. You can only refurbish a certain number of weapon systems at any given time. And if you want to expand that capacity, that in and of itself is going to take time. Time that Ukraine does not have. Time is on Russia's side. They know that all they have to do is take and hold territory while preserving the lives of their men and uh, the majority of their heavy equipment. If they have to trade territory temporarily to preserve the lives of their men and uh, preserve their equipment, they will, because they know whether Ukraine takes territory or not, they're going to lose huge amounts of men and equipment in the process. Men and equipment they cannot replace. However, Ukraine's fighting capacity is not going to simply collapse overnight. It's going to take time, and Russia is digging in for a protracted conflict. Time, again, is on their side. They're not looking at economic collapse or an energy crisis. Ukraine is. Europe is. All Russia has to do is achieve whatever its ultimate objective is before the US and its allies, if the US and its allies ever manage to exceed Russia's military industrial capacity and, and to fix all of these crises that they're dealing with and because of the, the self-inflicted damage they've done because of sanctions with uh, on Russia and also now increasingly with China. There's going to be an inflection point. This is going to be a, a, the most dangerous time the West will really be tempted to do something drastic to reverse uh, the irreversible uh, but slow collapse of Ukraine's fighting capacity. And they know that there will be a certain point where the, the whole world starts catching on and then everything will snowball. Uh, so they'll be tempted to maybe create a buffer zone or to intervene more directly. That'll be an extremely dangerous time. We really have to keep an eye out for this. We have to really try to do as much as possible to, to really get people informed so they understand what's going on and understand how important it is to hold their leadership, especially in the West, accountable. Now, if you're looking for daily analysis, in-depth analysis on Ukraine, I highly recommend the Duran and the individual channels of Alexander Mikuris and Alex Christoforo. They do daily videos uh, focused heavily on Ukraine, uh, the military situation, economics, geopolitical implications, I cannot recommend it enough, and they themselves include analysis from many other highly recommended experts. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. All of my YouTube videos are backed up on Rumble and Odyssey. I am on Telegram. I am also now back on Twitter for the time being. In the video description below, you will also find all of the links to everything that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize my YouTube videos. If you see an ad, please feel free to skip it. It's not helping me out at all. If you do want to help me out, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee, through Patreon, and through PayPal. To everyone who has been helping out, even if you're just helping share my work, I greatly appreciate that. I could not do this work without that support. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.